Grinding sucks, so let's remove it entirely. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, but to summarize, if a Pokemon faints, it's no longer usable. We can't use items in battle, but held items are fine. We'll be playing on set mode, and we can't overlevel past the next gym leader. But alongside this, we'll be adding a couple of extra rules. The main one being, we will not be allowed to earn any XP at any point during the challenge, whether it be through grinding or XP candies. Okay, well there wasn't really a way to bring that number all the way down to zero, so we will be earning 1 XP per Pokemon we knock out. But we shouldn't really ever gain enough to level up. If a Pokemon does somehow gain enough XP to level up, we'll just treat it as no longer being usable. And we'll also have my additional Galarian rules, including we can't use TRs, but TMs are fine. We can't use any encounters from DLC locations, and we won't be allowed to Dynamax our Pokemon. And those will be our rules. But I thought I should note that for encounters, a feature from Gen 7 that carried over is that each grass patch can have its own unique encounter table. To prevent myself from being locked out from them, before entering a route, I can make the decision to avoid all encounters until I get to my preferred grass patch. However, once I make that decision, I have to commit to it until I either get my encounter or leave the route. Any encounter I run into until then will be invalid. I can also choose to delay my encounter until later. Thought I'd mention this as our encounters will be more important than ever for this particular challenge, and this rule will be a way for me to get static encounters that will be integral to completing this challenge. My intros have been far too long lately, so let's just jump in. Our starter choice doesn't really matter in this game as quite frankly, after the tutorial section we will likely never use our early encounters again. I don't even give School Bunny a nickname. I figured if anything, the Garuki line usually gives me the most trouble during playthroughs, getting Razor Leaf early, which has a high crit rate, and Rillaboom is just a heavy hitter in general. Now we can get through Vulu as normal, but the lack of XP already presents an issue. School Bunny can't level up to learn Ember, meaning Garuki can just tear through us. Now I personally don't start Nuzlocke until I get Pokeballs, but I honestly don't think you can win this battle without extreme luck. Either Hop needs to just spam Growl, or we need a couple of well-placed crits. Maybe both. But let's just move on to our first two encounters. I land Scoivert on Route 1, who is actually really useful early on with Cheek Pouch, allowing it to recover a third of its HP after eating any berry. And we get Nicket on Route 2, who is honestly just pretty bad. Well, with no ability to train, let's just move on to our first battle with Hop. Hop leads with Wulu, and I send out Squivert, and yeah, that level difference is already very apparent. Wulu outspeeds with the tackle doing a third, and we hit back with a boosted payback, barely doing a quarter. This could be an issue. After Squivert gets growled out, I figure it's best to switch out to Nicket, as we can't afford to do even less damage. Who immediately takes a critical tackle? Somehow Wulu outspeeds with the tackle, activating the Orenberry, and I start pelting away at Wulu with beat up. And while Wulu could have easily taken Nicket out, Hop wastes a turn using Growl, allowing Nicket to bring Wulu down with a couple of quick attacks. This really could have gone a lot worse. Garuki's already out, so I switched out to School Bunny on the scratch. Oh no. Another scratch activates the berry. Listen, I could narrate the rest of the battle, but what can I say? It was a sweep. Garuki did almost half to all of my Pokemon per hit, while all we could do was chip away at it. The only reason why we could do any damage at all was because Hop forgot that he had attacking moves for a while. And we have already lost our first run. We used pretty much every tool we had at our disposal up until then, and we could do nothing. This challenge is going to be a lot more reliant on our encounter quality than initially thought. While there is something that we could do to make this a bit easier, I don't really want to play my cards too early. I'd rather save it as a mid-game reveal, so let's see how my current set of encounters do. This time I managed to land a Rookity rather than Nicket, which is a far better encounter. We start the battle the same as last time, Squivet whittling Wulu down, but then I bring out Skull Bunny to finish Wulu off. We get pretty lucky with how many growls Hop decided to use this time. Grookey's back out, so I switch back into Squivet, who takes a scratch. This activates the Orenberry, compounded with Cheek Pouch, restoring Squivet back up to full. And this time, instead of attacking, I start to spam Tail Whips as Grookey spams growls. After Grookey finally attacks, I switch into Rookity on another growl. Rookity takes a scratch, and after a minus 3 defense drop, Peck's able to do just about half. We're in pretty good shape as Grookey uses another scratch, and of course it gets a crit, but Rookity survives as it's able to take this monster down with the final Peck. Hop's Rookity is still left, but my other Pokemon have plenty of HP to take it down. I was not expecting our first important battle to give me this much trouble, though it seems to be a trend with my Galarian challenge runs. But with Hop behind us, we can truly begin the challenge by entering the wild area and getting access to a whole bunch of encounters who will be carrying us for a decent portion of the game. In the rolling fields, we first grab a Vanalite who I call Hunger and head to the Dappled Grove, running into a C-Dot. Excuse me? 
After five balls, I've already lost a Pokemon and the ball has shaken in total once. And I lose another Pokemon. I need to run away from my second encounter in the wild area. Turns out there's a mechanic in this game that I never really noticed before. Your levels directly impact your chances of catching wild Pokemon. I couldn't really find a calculator that accurately represented the capture odds, but they seem really low. And that's going to be a problem for us because our Pokemon will almost always be at a lower level whenever we're trying to upgrade our team. We managed to get away with two losses and Rookity in rough shape. The next encounter I run into is Stuffle, and like CDOT, it refuses to get in the ball. Now we had plenty of chances to run away, but look, we can't lose two encounters this early. There's just no point in continuing. CDOT rolled through my team, and Stuffle brutally massacres the survivors. And we have lost our second run. This time I get both Rookity and Blibbug, both of which have super effective moves against Grookey. I lead with Score Bunny with the sole purpose of bringing Wulu down. But then Wulu's Growl Spam reduced the amount of damage Score Bunny does to almost nothing. Into Blibbug, and Hop seems a bit too reliant on using Growls as we can bring Wulu down after a couple of struggle bugs. Wulu does manage to get a last tackle in that does almost half. If Hop was smart enough to only attack, there could have been two mons down already. With Rook D coming out this time, I switch back into Score Bunny who takes a lot of damage from Peck. I just keep using tackles, and we actually get a crit. However, I don't really want my other Pokemon taking any more damage, so goodbye Score Bunny. Or not. And then Rookity uses Leer. Another tackle taking Rookity down. And then I realized that Rookity had unnerve all this time, and Score Bunny gets a second win with the Narenberry. I figure why not stay in for a tackle since we have more HP now. And Grookey gets a crit on the first turn. But this gives us a free switch into Rookity, and while Grookey does get off a couple of growls, with the Orenberry, we're still able to out-damage Hop, and we're on our third attempt at this battle. I genuinely think this battle comes down to luck, whether you get the right encounters, and whether Hop chooses to attack or not. But we're done with that, so let's just move on. Back into the wild area, and we once again find Vanalite. Unfortunately, Vanalite's moveset at this level is pretty bad, and it's obviously not going to get much better without our limitations. But back in the Dappled Grove, we had an amazing stroke of luck, landing the older sister of the seed that sweeped half my team. A 5% chance. After setting up a scary amount of growth and using an absorb just barely leaving Rookity alive, our Pokeball is actually able to capture this monster. Now there are a number of reasons why our new hunger is amazing, but for now, we finally have a Pokemon with a level in the ballpark of other encounters in this area, making them a lot easier to catch. Unfortunately, our next one is Fatigue the Bounce Wheat and then Sleep the Temple, who gave me a mini heart attack. I don't hate these Pokemon by any means. In fact, I love both of their evolutions, but as far as first stage Pokemon go, these are pretty weak. As a side note, this is probably the stupidest naming convention I've ever come up with. I'll genuinely be amazed if anyone guesses it. Thankfully, these encounters don't set us back as Hunger with Stab Payback is able to steamroll through the first few battles, including Hop, whose best move to deal with us is Peck. And Rookity's down with one payback. I think Hop's already peaked. I get another mini heart attack on Route 3, sending Hunger out against Dottler, who I completely forgot was a bug type, who has bug moves, using Struggle Bug, leaving Hunger on just 3 HP. Thankfully, even without the boost, Payback did over half, putting an end to that quickly. Here we get Infancy the Pancham. Not amazing, but at least we have some fighting coverage. The more important encounter is the one that we get in mind number one. I decide to ignore the initial encounters and head up to the upper exit where I can grab the TM for Rock Blast. Now I can re-enter the mines and wait in ambush for the encounter I was actually looking for. Unfortunately, Trotkin didn't take me to a new world, but instead gave me an encounter that will basically carry us for the whole next section. But first, we need to actually catch Karkol. It's 5 levels above sleep, which means we have a capture debuff, and it's got super effective moves against 4 of my 6 Pokemon. And then we get it in the third ball. It's nice to catch a break every now and then. I call him friendship. Just as we did for friendship, Beads waiting in ambush at the back of the mine. Fortunately for us, we have a Pokemon hungry for blood. Payback's able to one-shot every single one of his Pokemon. On Route 4, I grab Skull the Meowth. And with us in Turfield, we can move straight on to the first gym. I think Milo has the random move AI, as despite Grass being neutral, Milo opts to use the not very effective Rapid Spin, and two Flame Charges later, we're already on the next Pokemon. I think it's because the AI really likes speed control, as even when Gossifler Dynamaxes, it uses Max Strike trying to lower friendship speed. Of course, we're only using Flame Charges, so it never really works out the way Milo wants. And thus, Milo spends all of his Dynamax turns using not very effective attacks, Gossifler going down to a final Flame Charge, earning us the first badge. Okay, that was easy, but I'm not getting ahead of myself this time. I've been screwed over by my own hubris far too many times playing these games. Moving forward on Route 5, I run into Stuffle who I call Bullying. 
and this was a massive mistake. I actually had something planned out, but with us getting an encounter here, that's pretty much out the window. But I'm used to being a mistake, so let's not let that gas down. At least bullying her stab strength this early on, taking Team Yell's lunch money with ease. At the end of the bridge, Hop's still trying his best to be relevant to the plot, but with our well-balanced set of encounters, he's gonna be staying in the background a bit longer. I mean, he has Razor Leaf and he still decides to use Round on Carcoal. Walking past the bridge, I'm reminded of my mistake, and moving into Holbury, I need to rethink my plan. First, for whatever reason, I make yet another mistake, and roll for a new encounter by fishing, landing Chewtool. I call it homework because no one likes homework. The reason this was a mistake will be apparent soon enough, but a water type obviously isn't going to be useful against the next gem anyway, so I have no clue why I tried. But I did have a backup plan. Now earlier, I said Hunger was an amazing encounter, but I haven't really had the opportunity to show her off. Well, we're already fighting Pokemon in their 20s, and she's still 13, so her usefulness is probably already over, right? Nuzleaf can evolve using a stone, no XP needed, so therefore it's perfectly fine by my rules, and a leaf stone can be found back in Turfield. Having a fully evolved Pokemon this early is massive as we're already fighting fully evolved Pokemon ourselves without having the same luxuries. But that's not all. Stone evolutions in particular have another massive advantage. They have an amazing move pool that from this generation we have access to by just visiting a Pokemon Center. By using the move relearner services, we have access to endgame moves before the second gym. So I spruce up Hunger's moveset, give my other Pokemon some tools to help out, and we're ready to take on Nessa. My plan for Nessa is incredibly simple. Goldene starts off with a horn attack, doing just under half, and Hunger sets up a sunny day. There are three advantages to doing this. Water moves are weakened. Hunger has the ability Chlorophyll, which doubles the speed under the sun. And now Growth raises both attack stats by two stages. We can turn Hunger into a monster. Though I think it's best to end Goldene early. It's doing a bit too much damage. A plus two Leaf Blade one shots. With Aracute out, we're safe to set up the remaining grows as it has no moves to do any meaningful damage to us. But I should use a turn to make light of a fourth advantage of the sun. Synthesis can now recover back 75% of Hunger's HP as opposed to its regular 50%. And with all of our grows set up and the sun back, Aracuda goes down to a leaf blade. Dreadnought comes out but can a shift three out speed even with a plus two speed boost. Dreadnought Dynamaxes. And Hunger can move first, using a plus 6, 4 times effective Leaf Blade, one-shotting Nessa's Ace, even while Dynamaxed and with an 11 level disadvantage. I knew Hunger was going to do massive damage, but that was pretty hyped to see Ashley play out, especially with how low-leveled she is. What an upset. B's got levels on us, but after a sunny day in growth, Hunger's able to brutally swing her way through. Unfortunately, Hop's as useless as ever and ends up getting fatigue killed as he decided to be a pacifist during our battle with Team Yell. And to rub salt on the wound, just up ahead we're reminded of our failure. The next gem is a fire gem. Half of my team is weak to fire, and just up ahead we have the perfect encounter. Dreadnought. Both of its types are strong against fire, and more importantly, its levels roughly match Carbu's. This would have been perfect if we hadn't already gotten homework. I get beached the shallows instead. Outside of the mine, we have a chance to get the very common pseudo Wudo, another Pokemon perfect for this gym. We get the even more common Noctowl, who we call Pop Quiz. This isn't looking too good. And I wasn't even thinking about our next battle, Marnie. Well, at least one good thing about Pop Quiz is that she handles two of Marnie's Pokemon and has two pretty good moves to do so. Extra sensory one shots Krogunk. Morpeko's next, but a couple of bulldozers from bullying is able to bring her low. Unfortunately, bullying's down range of a quick attack, so I switch out to Hunger to tank, as she can resist both the Morpeko stabs. Bite comes out, and leaves Hunger on just one HP. I mean, I'll be honest, it's not like we really need Hunger anymore. But I wasn't expecting that. Into friendship, and Bite's still able to do almost half. I decide to risk the crit, and even friendship hangs on by just one HP. Also managing to get off a burn. Doesn't matter as our friendship is unshaken, being able to take more Peko down with a flame charge. Scrafty's out, and Pop Quiz can clean up with an air slash. Marnie's more Peko always seems to give me trouble. At least we've made it out with no losses, because next up is Kabu, and I suspect I'll need most of my encounters with this one. We actually get another encounter during the gym mission. I decided to pick Vulpix as it's another stone evolution, and like Shift Tree, Ninetales gets access to some pretty amazing moves. I call him Sports Day, on to Kabu. I lead with bullying, and knowing that Ninetales will go for a Will-O-Wisp, I go for a Stab Facade that does double the damage if you're statist, and also ignores the damage drop from Burn. And we still don't even do half. We stay in for an attack, and Ember doesn't seem to do all that much. A couple more Facades bring Ninetales down. Bullying staying in can also absorb Arc-9's Intimidate, and I switch into Beach on the Flame Wheel. 
Arcanine goes for a burn, as Water Pulse does just about a quarter, and that's pretty much my strategy. Arcanine switches to start using Bite, but Beach manages to push past the flinches until Arcanine gets brought down into red. Knowing a bite's coming, I switch into Hunger to absorb that, basing a Flame Ball on the switch to Friendship. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the Steam Engine ability, so we do have to risk the Bite flinches, but Friendship is unfazed. Being able to get two Rock Polishes off, it can outspeed finish Arcanine off with a Rock Blast. Finally, it's the Ace Center Scorch, and the reason we went to the trouble of raising Friendship speed is because Rock is four times effective. Center Scorch Giganta maxes, and a four times effective Rock Blast does nothing. It hits three times and does about a third. Max Flutterby brings an end to our friendship, and we bring out homework for his big moment, stalling out Center Scorch's Giganta Max. Goodbye, homework. This gives me a free switch into Pop Quiz as Center Scorch returns to normal, and it can outspeed to use an S Slash. Not getting the kill, but we get a flinch, an extra sensory finishes Center Scorch off, getting us our third badge. We've actually gotten a lot of mileage out of Pop Quiz considering my initial reaction to her. There's really not much to do in this next section. We can get a lot more encounters now in the wild area with the increased level cap, but with all the blunders I made earlier, I've become pretty adverse to just catching Pokemon until I really need them. So for the time being, I just ignore all of the encounters in the wild area. I do decide to pick up something on Route 6, as there aren't really many static encounters here, so putting off our encounters wouldn't really help. I land detention, the Silicobra. With that, we can just make our way towards Stone side with no issues at all. Okay, maybe one issue. Two issues. Three issues. Okay, three issues. I always forget about this artist and his stupid face. His pseudo wudu can be genuinely really threatening if you're unprepared. Right, that thing I said about ignoring encounters in the wild area? Ignore that. Back we go. I head to the giant seat to grab Exam, the bronze ore. I wasn't expecting it to be that high leveled. And then to the stony wilderness where we can actually call down on these guys right here. So Jilif is actually a really good encounter, having some pretty good mid-game stats and also getting access to some pretty good moves early on. I could have gotten this a bit later so that it would have better moves, but I'm kinda desperate. Welcome Holiday. This really is the stupidest naming convention I've used. Not gonna lie, I completely forgot that we had a hot battle here. Hop leads with Cramoran, starting off with a Fury attack while we set up a Reflect. Cramoran goes for a dive, causing Popquist to miss, and even though Reflect is up, it does about a quarter. And then Cramoran shoots an Aracuda, doing an additional quarter. Air Slash was not worth that. Into Holiday as Cramoran jumps back into the water. Dived is significantly less to Holiday, and I figure I don't really want to deal with this thing right now. Toxel comes out as Reflect wears off, and then goes down to a single side beam. I'm not sure if that crit mattered. Thwacky comes out, and I figure I can put an end to him early. Air Cast is doing over half. And then Thwacky pulls off a boosted knockoff, bringing Holiday right down into red. I decide to risk the 5% miss chance, and it pays off, Thwacky going down. Next up is Celicobra, who I don't really have anything for, so I send out bullying as it gets paralyzed by Glare. Which is actually perfect for us. Well, after I can move. We use a boosted stab facade. And that's all it does. Into detention as Silicobra digs into the ground. And we manage to outspeed digging into the ground ourselves, causing Silicobra's dig to miss. And then detention also gets paralyzed, meaning we can't do this anymore. I use Silicobra's dig as an opportunity to switch into Pop Quiz, who can outspeed to finish Silicobra off with an air slash. And we're back to this thing. I figure I might as well stay in as Cramoran goes for a Fury attack, which doesn't get the kill, allowing us to get off a Reflect. I send out Bullying, hoping to get off at least one boosted facade, but she goes down to a dive. This thing's actually starting to look pretty scary. I bring out Exam, hoping to at least tank his moves, and then Cramoran goes for a Fury attack. Hop, I don't understand you as a person. And just like that, we won the battle. Turns out I gave Exam a Rocky Helmet, and each time Fury attack connects, Cramoran takes damage. Despite getting two crits, Rocky Helmet manages to bring Cramoran all the way down into red, and Hypnosis also connects. We can finish this battle with a final extra sensory, or Hop can use a super potion bringing Cramoran back to almost full. God damn it, Hop. Well, I've already revealed my plan, it basically goes down the way you'd expect. What a needlessly long battle. I genuinely don't think I've struggled against Cramoran before, but I've been humbled. We've got the fourth gym ahead, but truth be told, we don't really have many Pokemon that can deal with fighting types well. Pop Quiz has super effective moves, but takes neutral damage from fighting, and will likely go down to a single hit. Exam's levels are good, and is fairly bulky, but its damage output has been pretty lackluster so far. Holiday's probably our only hope, but almost all of the fighting Pokemon we're about to face have dark moves that are strong against him. And on top of that, our level matchup is pretty abysmal. 
But fret not, for we do have yet another encounter that we can get. Just past the gym, we can enter the Glitterwood Tangle, and while Team Yell is blocking the way, there is indeed a small patch of grass we can get in the encounter. And we actually managed to land a fairy. Unfortunately, it's Morgrem, who also has a dark typing, making fighting attacks neutral, and has a pretty bad bulk, meaning those neutral attacks could be lethal. We do manage to catch it fairly easily, and it has no fairy moves. Perfect. Well, we could go back to the wild area, but with our level cap, our encounters are limited, and we don't really want to waste encounters on random chances. We haven't let something like a crippling disadvantage get us down before, so let's just make do. While all the gym trainers are forced, thankfully Holiday is able to tear through them with ease using Psybeam. Oh. On to Bea. B. Bea. Beatrice. Beatrice leaves with Hitmontop and I send out Sports Day. Okay, that level difference looks pretty bad, but trust me, I have a plan. Sports Day outspeeds hit a Will-O-Wisp, burning Hitmontop, cutting his already poor attack in half. And Hitmontop uses a boosted revenge, doing half anyway. Okay, maybe my plan has some holes in it. Leftovers put Sports Day above half, so I test my luck using a nasty plot, and Hitmontop uses revenge, leaving Sports Day on just 1 HP. How often has this happened in this run alone? Alright, cool, we get another turn. And then Hitmontop moves first using Quick Attack, putting an end to Sports Day. Listen, we all have days where everything we do ends in failure. Why do I even try to go for flashy tactics? Alright, let's just bring out our star, Holiday. Psybeam does just about half, and Hitmontop goes for a counter. Maybe Beatrice feels sorry for me. Another Psybeam, and we can forget about what happened. Next up is a scary dark type, Pangoro, who has Night Slash. I can't stay in, but I also don't want any of my Pokemon taking too much damage on the Switch this early. I send out my brave little Rookadi, and come on, you didn't need to also crit her. Thank you for your service, Rookadi. This gives me a safe switch into Pop Quiz, and somehow, Poe is able to outspeed using Work Up, raising its attack. Pop Quiz sets up a Reflect to negate this. Pangoro overcompensates with another Work Up, giving us a chance to use a super effective Air Slash, and that's all it does? Another Work Up, and alright, you gotta stop. We use another Air Slash, not quite getting the kill. Alright, we just need to survive one hit. And then we move first, hitting the final Air Slash. Of all turns to use Revenge, why now? I mean, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Out comes Surfetch, and I see no reason to switch out. It very strategically wastes a turn using Detect to under Reflect, but the absolute fool failed to realize I can just outspeed to set it back up. Huh? Can't I just once have a stroke of good luck without immediately being balanced out? Goodbye, Pop Quiz. You're a lot better than I thought you'd be. Back in the holiday, and Psybeam does over half as Surfetch sets up a Swords Dance. We outspeed, it doesn't matter, get out of here. And finally, it's the Ace Machamp. It has super effective moves, but it reflects still up, so I feel brave enough to stay in. We outspeed, and miss Hypnosis. But Max Darkness doesn't manage to get the kill. We outspeed, and I don't want my other Pokemon taking damage yet, so stay in one more turn. And we actually hit the Hypnosis. Machamp loses a turn of Dynamax. Into exam, and Machamp loses his final turn of Dynamax. Oh no, this can't be good. Unfortunately, Machamp does outspeed, and what did we just say about my luck? We hang by on 9 HP, losing our expert belt, and yup, should have known. Well, there's no reason to keep exam alive. Sorry, bud. Oh, that works too. Another extra sensory, and can this game hear me? Goodbye, exam. I'm torn, as I'm not entirely sure if Holiday can one-shot, but what's Detention gonna do? I decide to bring out Detention. Knockoff does massive damage as usual, and we detain Machamp with Glare. It does have Guts, but it's all or nothing. This at least gives us a chance to whittle its HP down with Dig. Goodbye, Detention. Alright, it's all on you, Holiday. We outspeed. And Psybeam is indeed enough to finally bring Machamp down, earning us that fourth badge. With our final Pokemon. At what stage did that battle start going horribly wrong? Was it my initial blunder? Was it me getting too much luck? Well, whatever the case, we need encounters. Desperately. Unfortunately, our level caps only jumped by two levels, so our encounter pool is still pretty limited. But fortunately, there's only one encounter that we need, and it's pretty much guaranteed. Back into the wild area, we head south of Hammerlock towards the Dusty Bowl. And over in this little dirt patch, there's a high chance of a sought-after encounter spawning. That of course being Excadrill. Now this thing has amazing moves, amazing stats, and also an overwhelming advantage over the next gym. Only one move across all of Opal's Pokemon being able to hit us for- excuse me? Huh. And we have lost a third run. No really. By my rules, that is most certainly a wipe. Another run lost to a wild encounter. Four badges in, and we're still struggling with simply catching Pokemon. This isn't what the challenge was supposed to be. 
We were supposed to have really close calls while fighting trainers who are usually considered to be pretty easy, but our god awful levels would cause us to have to think of out of the box strategies, and that in turn would cause some wacky hijinks that we could all laugh at together. Instead, I'm struggling to catch the f***ing Pokemon I need to make that actually happen. I need content, man. Speaking of which, next run. We get the exact same encounters as last time, and yet still lose to Hop. Next run. Alright, enough of that. I don't want to spend the next two hours of my life here. So, time to pull up my mid-game bullshit strat. I was hoping to save this for later, but we actually need to be able to make it there first. So there's specifically a reason why this is the no XP challenge and not the no level challenge. Because there is in fact a way we can earn levels without needing any XP at all. And by my rules outlined at the start, leveling is completely fine as long as there is no XP involved. And that is of course by using an old channel friend, Rare Candies. And using this, we can level up Score Bunny so that he learns what? Sorry, let me replay that. Never once, not once in the history of this franchise have Rare Candies ever been associated with XP. It would always say something along the lines of, your Pokemon has been elevated to level 51, with no mention of XP at all. What was supposed to happen was that Score Bunny would level up to learn Ember at level 6, and we could use that to beat Hop the old fashioned way. But unfortunately, according to my rules, that little box of flavor text basically invalidates the strategy, which has completely thrown off any planning I had done for the late game. Like this was supposed to be the grand reveal, but that's another reset. We aren't beating Hop with just two Pokemon. This time I actually land Wulu and Yampa, two pretty rare encounters, and they have decent levels too. Wulu even has the ability Fluffy, which basically doubles its defense, allowing it to win the one-on-one -on -one against Top's Wulu. I decided to use a couple of turns to paralyze Grookey with Yampa's nuzzle, and even Grookey is not able to do anything against Wulu's fortified wool. With the help of an Orenberry, we are able to take another one of Hop's Pokemon. Eventually. And we can wrap up the battle with a couple of paybacks. That was probably one of the easiest Top 1 battles I've had so far. But considering what happened with B, Beatrice, is that really going to be a good thing? Alright, my initial mid-game BS strat failed, but did you really think that was the only trick I had up my sleeve? Of course not. No, for this run, we're going full-on sweaty mode. Anything that is even technically legal by my rules is fair game. And we can actually get started immediately with access to the wild area. But even this requires some initial luck, because we need to catch a Pokemon, and we already know what that entails. In the rolling fields, we are going to ignore all of our initial encounters and head into this little grove here. Here we can find a guaranteed static encounter, Roselia. And to my surprise, the only damaging moves it has is Absorb and Leech Seed. We managed to catch Gardening in the fifth ball with us only having lost Wulu. Truly tragic. And this will be the only Pokemon we catch for this entire next section. There's still more to do in the wild area, but first we do some story stuff so that we can unlock the flying taxis. And back we go. The thing is that we can actually explore the entirety of the wild area right from the start. Well, anywhere that we can get by on foot. And we can do this while being able to avoid encounters entirely, as we can just dodge them in this game, without needing to rely on repels, meaning minimizing the chances of death. This is an important point to make, as our next step is to walk all the way to the daycare underneath the bridge field to establish a fly point. While here, we can also grab some citrus berries. These trees refresh the stock every day, and in theory, we could just progress the game by a day and farm these. So by my rules, we now have an unlimited amount of berries that we have access to via berry trees. We can now just fly back to the Motosoke entrance and move around collecting rods from all of the raid ends, wait until the next day once we run out, and do this all over again, as many times as we want, never risking any Pokemon. But why are we doing this? While well, flying back to the daycare, from here we can head in the opposite direction until we run into these strapping young gentlemen. Meet the digging duo. These two brothers are our salvation, as what they can do is dig for treasures, as many times as you want, for a measly 500 watts, a currency which we can get unlimited amounts of. And what that means is that by my rules, we now have unlimited watts, and unlimited access to whatever items we can get through exploiting the labor of these two idiots. And extending on that, since we can just sell the items we get, we also now have unlimited money. Before the first badge, before even leaving the first major city we visit, I hope you can see why I banned TRs. Now that's all well and good, but why is this important this early on? Well of all of the items that the digging duo can dig up, these also include the evolutionary stones. And we conveniently happen to have a Pokemon that evolves using a shiny stone. Meaning before the first gym, we will always have access to a guaranteed Rosa Raid, so long as you can catch it. And like I said right near the stars, Stone Evolutions get access to amazing moves right from the Pokemon Center's very own mover learner. So we can have a powerful Grass Poison type, perfect for Milo's gym. Ironically, the only poison move Roserade gets by level up is Poison Sting, but I can hardly complain. 
Beat can be a bit annoying with a psychic Pokemon, but after a growth, Giga Drain one shots all of them. And Stupid Milo still tries to use grass moves against Pokemon that four times resist grass, even wasting two of his Dynamax turns. What was he thinking? Needless to say, we sweep. And immediately after getting our first badge and increasing our level caps, we're gonna surgically get our next few encounters. First we head back to the Motostoke entrance and head to West Lake Axwell where we can get this beautiful boy right here. I thought her levels would be a bit higher. Roserade resists all of Quagsire's attacks so we can just catch fishing with ease using a net ball. Now we can head back to the mines but rather than earning our food we once again attempt a health insurance scam but run into Carcol instead. Fishing resists Carcol's attacks so welcome back friendship. And now back to Route 3 where we can cat call Call the Squire, provoking him to attack. Friendship resists all of his attacks, so Flight eventually gets into the ball. And with our well-balanced team, we can walk right through Hop. Now I was actually smart enough to avoid encounters this time, so we can ambush this poor flower just minding its own business. Look at it trying to blend into the bridge. Lowering his health with a couple of flame charges, we can add Field Trip to the team. Gardening can sweep through Nessa's first two Pokemon, but we're not outspeeding Dreadnought, so after protecting for one turn, I offer Gardening to the Dynamax Gods and stall one last turn with Field Trip. And Field Trip can end this with a Magical Leaf. Alright, the next turn. I actually didn't have a plan if she got flinched again. Probably should have thought of one. Well with that, if you haven't noticed, I've completely ignored the encounter in the city. Specifically so that I can land the Dreadnought in mine number two. I do however lose Yamper while trying to paralyze it, but with Field Trip knowing Sing, it's level and a netball, sailing's pretty easy to catch. Back to the Motostoke outskirts and what encounter will we get this time? It's Fate. Welcome back Pop Quiz. Although this time at a lower level, oh well, I'm aware of the fact that you're actually good now. I figure there's no harm in fishing up an encounter in Holbury now and we land Seafood, the Aracuda. Need to fill out my team after all. And with our encounters, we're able to sail right through Kabu with no issues at all. I made a revelation that I honestly should have thought of the moment I stepped into the wild area. Now the biggest issue we've had so far is catching Pokemon. This is mostly because of our levels, but we do also have a separate issue. Our equipment. There really aren't many different Pokeballs that we can actually buy at this point from stores. But the wild area traders sell more than just TRs. Each one sells a random Pokeball which I believe is shuffled every day. And we can buy these balls with what? Which we have an unlimited amount of. So I travelled across the land, searching far and wide, until we found two traders. One that sells quick balls, which apply a 5 times multiplier to your catch chance if it's the first turn. And one that sells dusk balls, which apply a 4 times multiplier if it's night. Compare these to the grey balls that we've been using that have a 1.33 multiplier. This is a massive buff. With our ability to actually catch Pokemon, I figure I might as well start getting the encounters I know I need. Time to give an old friend a visit. No. Oh good. Cool, just as planned. Welcome rock climbing. I decided to save holiday for later so that we can get one with the better moveset, instead of heading to East Lake Axwell where I pick up Zatu. Or Pelipper. God, that was so satisfying. Not the encounter I wanted, and it doesn't really have the moves that we want at that level either. But rather, even better, we landed the 50% chance for it to have the ability Drizzle. Being able to set up rain after being sent out. This won't really be relevant now, but could be really useful later. We've got a pretty strong team this time around, but unfortunately still nothing really special for beer. Let's try the Glitter with Tangle again, and we land Swirlix. Positives. Toothache's a fairy type, like a pure one. One that actually resists fighting and dark. Negatives. It's a Swirlix. I'm not expecting much. We can actually evolve it by getting a Whip Dream from the Cafe Master who we can battle every day. Holding this while being traded, Toothache can evolve into a Slurpuff. It is a fairy type. I can't complain. Pretty decent moves as well. Oh my god, what does stuff all hit so hard? We've actually already lost Pop Quiz. To the first trainer in this gym. She was actually supposed to be a staple on my team for this battle. Now that we've entered the gym, I'm not allowed to leave by my rules. So now we only have two Pokemon to deal with her. And we still have two more trainers to go. Why didn't I just catch Holiday? Okay, Toothache. Wait, don't tell me you're actually good. She just swept through those last two trainers. Do we actually have a chance? Time for a rematch with Beatrice. I figure why not give Toothache a chance to prove herself. We use the first turn using a draining kiss, doing over half as Hitmontop uses revenge. We might actually be fine. I set up a wish the next turn as Hitmontop uses an unboosted revenge. Which crits. Wasting my citrus berry. Unfortunate, but we're still in a good position for Pangoro. I know it has bullet punch, but this just seems like a bad idea. A super effective bullet punch doesn't even do a quarter. And a four times effective play rough. One shots Pangoro. Next up is Surfetch, who I set up a wish on as Revenge does nothing. Draining Kiss does over half, and after being hit with a boosted Revenge, our wish brings us right back up to full. 
Another draining kiss, and we're already on the final Pokemon. Machamp Gigantamaxes, but we have nothing to be afraid of. I set up a Protect on the first turn to negate most of the damage from Max Strike. And it does even less than I thought. Like, we can survive an unprotected one. I test my luck staying in. And Max Strike from the big strong Machamp barely brings Toothache below half. I use this turn to set up a Wish. One more Protect on the final Max Strike, and we recover back all the progress Machamp made. Machamp uses a pitiful strength. And let's just set up a Wish for good measure. Another strength does bring us low, but a Draining Kiss and Wish brings us back all the way. And all it takes is a final play rough to bring us back to where we were. I'm so sorry I ever doubted you, Toothache. It's actually insane how much of a difference one encounter makes. Unfortunately, Swirlix is not guaranteed, so that was entirely up to luck. Now with rock climbing, there aren't really more preparations we need to make. If you haven't watched my previous shield runs, Opal is probably one of the worst gym leaders in existence. Her wheezing's only coverage move is tackle. We can basically just wall it using rock climbing and start setting up home claws, as the most wheezing can do is use fairy wind. We can even get free boost from Opal, getting a plus two defense boost right from the start. Wheezing goes down to one metal claw. Morwell's the only Pokemon that can hit us for neutral damage, but we outspeed and it goes down to a single bulldoze. Togekiss is probably our only good Pokemon, but this too is walled by steel. It goes down to a single Metal Claw. And finally, it's the Ace Alcremi, who Dynamaxes, only to be brought down by a single Metal Claw. Fifth badge. I'll admit, it was nice to have an easy win. We kinda needed that. With our level cap actually increasing a decent amount, we have access to a whole bunch of encounters in the wild area. And what I really want is a ghost type. The normal and fighting immunity would be big, and they can also be really good at stalling. And we have the perfect encounter just right at the Motorstoke entrance. Next to the Watchtower, we have a static encounter that's level 40. This is dependent on weather, but more often than not, it will be a Dusclops. And if any of you have played VGC, you know that this would be amazing just because of its utility. We can even evolve it if we want, but I think Halloween would be more helpful holding an Eviolite. Next on my list is South Lake Mylock. Here we can catch ourselves a guaranteed Machoke. It's only level 31, but that's better than most of our Pokemon already, and better yet, we can immediately evolve powerlifting into a Machamp by trading. I think this should be enough for the time being as we can also get a couple of encounters on the route to the next gym. Our road hop exists. I kinda forgot about this battle so I had powerlifting out, but he has payback so let's just stay in. We get confused but powerlifting still manages to get off a boosted payback and it turns out confusion doesn't activate guts. Trevenant hits a horn leech, recovering some HP and then losing it to a rocky helmet. And we hit another payback, taking Trevenant down. Now I almost always forget about this hot battle but what I don't forget is the Snorlax. This has given me trouble in almost every Galar challenge I've done on this channel, but this time we have a Machamp. Powerlifting out speeds, low sweep doing over half. Alright, let's end this quick. And Snorlax uses a body slam, leaving powerlifting on just 8 HP. And then he gets paralyzed. Kinda just get one easy KO. Alright, at least we have Rock Climb, who completely walls Snorlax. And body slam paralyzes Rock Climbing. I'm not sure what I expected. And then we miss a Metal Claw. As Snorlax sets up stockpile raising his defense. Look, I already foresee the Hyper Potion, so I just switch out Halloween and land a curse as Snorlax sets up another stockpile. Curse brings Snorlax right down to heal range, which Hop of course takes advantage of, so we just burn Snorlax. Now all we need to do is just stall out the curse. I figure two things is probably best for the job with Wish and Protect. Heavy Slam is super effective, but with the burn we're pretty safe. I love Gen 5 and most of the Pokemon in its decks, but I always forget about this thing. First I switch into Halloween to take advantage of the wish that Toothache set up. I figure switching into Parasailing is my best bet, Fire Lash doing nothing, but it does drop my defense. We survive a Slash, and Weather Ball now boosted under the rain, just misses the kill. We could survive a Slash, but a crit would kill, and it's too early to risk an encounter as good as Drizzle Pelipper. When did I get one of these? And it doesn't have a single move to his brother. Amazing. Into Halloween and Hex finishes heat more off. Next up is Bolton, so I switch into Toothache anticipating the crunch. Based on the damage that did, I figure we can survive a spark. And then play rough misses. Alright, we can just stall this thing out with Wish. And then it rules bringing out Parasailing. But this gives me a safe switch into Rock Climbing, gaining the health from Wish. And thankfully, Paralysis does not screw me over. Bolton goes down to a dig. Finally, it's a terrifying roll boom, and unfortunately, Bolton's raw shenanigans means that the rain's up. Literally, no one else can take a drum beating aside from heat waves, so it's your time to shine. And yeah, that doesn't look too good. At least the rain clears, and then slam hits and crits. Good work, champ. I'll see you next decade. Rillaboom does have knockoff, but I need to burn it, so out comes Halloween. He survives the knockoff, losing his Eviolite, and manages to get off the Will O Wisp, burning Rillaboom. I anticipated another knockoff, so I switched into Toothache, and Hop reads me going for drum beating. We can survive another, but I'm not sure about a Chris. And Toothache tanks. 
She sets up a wish, and we can just stall a turn using Protect. Toothaker recovers back her HP. And that's pretty much our strategy. Wish stall when our HP is low and attack when we get a chance until Rillaboom finally goes down. Look at what Hob did to me. He's not supposed to have this power. Toothache has performed above and beyond my initial expectations. Do I always underestimate this battle? Yes. Am I going to forget about it the moment this run ends? Yes. I want to avoid all of the encounters on Rue 7 for now, but Lipart has different ideas. What was that speed? Despite being so desperate to be on my team, Adoption took over 20 balls before getting in, while I had a Pokemon just 4 levels below him. At least Toothache pretty much walled him. On Route 8, we have a particular encounter that we want. It's a tight squeeze to avoid encounters, but we can eventually come across the exact group of friends that we want. These six pals stick by each other no matter the circumstances. They fight together, and they faint together. The perfect companions that we need on our adventure. I call them childhood. And with our new additions, we can move straight on to our next gym. Gordy's a Chad. He leads with Barbarical and I send out Toothache. We don't outspeed, but Rock Team doesn't do much. A 4 times effective energy ball one shots Barbarical. Or not. Alright, let's just stay in for one more and Razor Shell leaves Toothache on just 5 HP. I kind of forgot this thing had tough claws, and Rock Team isn't affected by it. That was a bit reckless. Barbarical goes down to a second energy ball. With Shuckle out, I switch into level 26 parasailing, setting up the rain, a Shuckle uses power split, which averages both of our attacking stats. All part of the plan. I figure it's weak enough for me to stay in, and Weather Ball does about a third. Stone Edge comes out, and I think we were just outside of crit range. I'm playing a bit risky today. I figure I can switch out to rock climbing now that Shuckle shouldn't go for another power split, and he'd resist Shuckle's moves. Now I just set up a home clause as Shuckle switches to Struggle Bug. From here, a single rock slide finishes Shuckle off. With our speed drop and Stone Journer being surprisingly speedy, Stone Journer moves first to use a Wonder Room, swapping his defensive stats. Which was an odd decision, as we're a physical attacker and it just reduces physical defense to 20. It basically dug its own grave. Finally, we're on the Ace Colossal. Now, I should have switched because of the speed drop, but I figured it's pretty slow, right? Colossal Dynamaxes. And we do outspeed, digging into the ground. I'll be honest, I regretted staying in the moment I selected that move. A plus one, four times effective dig, one shots the Dynamax Colossal with a nine level disadvantage. Another easy gym. I know this won't last, so I'll savor every moment I can sweep through an important battle. Though I admittedly did play a bit rough. I've spent enough time feeling good about myself. Time for another battle with Hop. He leads with double and I once again begin with powerlifting. Takedown does over half, activating my Citrus Berry and a boosted revenge is enough to bring double down. Unfortunately, we don't really have anything for Corviknight, but rock climbing does wall him. Drawpeck still does a bit. I figure maybe I can try for a flinch, but Corviknight outspeeds. Kind of forgot about the level gap. And yeah, we definitely aren't winning this one-on-one. -on -one. I send out my bulky Halloween, who matches Hop's levels, and Drawpeck still does a lot. At least Corviknight gives me a break using Scary Face as we burn him. I don't really know what Corviknight was hoping to accomplish with another scary face, but this does give me a free turn to use Hex, actually doing a lot. Now I was hoping that Burn plus Hail would bring Corviknight down, but I kind of neglected the fact that he was in heal range, giving Hop a free turn to heal as I switched out to Adoption. I go for a flinch with Fake Out, hoping to get that extra ship damage on Corviknight, but I'm not too hopeful. We can use a couple of Home Claws as Hop uses Scary Face and Draw Peck, not doing much thanks to the Burn. And then Hop outplays me using another pointless Scary Face as I fail to suck a punch. And the mad lad does it again. Finally, Sucker Punch lands and finishes Corviknight off, but our HP is already quite low. And we're already on the scary Rillaboom. I switch out to Halloween expecting Brook Break and then Toothache on the knockoff, hoping to use the same strat as the last time. Completely forgetting that Rillaboom isn't burned. Drum beating does a lot. But we do manage to get a wish off, but aside from healing ourselves up, there's not much we can do. I switch out to Childhood as Drum beating does almost half. Hell does more damage, but it activates our Citrus Berry. Childhood has battle armor, so it can survive one more turn. I outspeed with the first impression, just missing the kill, and we survived the drum beating. What happened? That wasn't a crit. It literally can't be. Turns out I made the same mistake I make no matter how many times I play these games. The starters have abilities. Specifically, every starter gets a default ability that increases the power of their primary type by 50% if their health is below a third. In this case, drum beating on a 50% boost being enough to end our childhood. We turn to adoption. Fake out flinch plus hail damage finishes this monster off. And we haven't even dealt with Snorlax yet. I decide I need to take a risk and stay in for one more crunch. Dodging the crit, Halloween gets off a Will-O-Wisp. And I completely forgot about hail in the moment. We hang on with 5 HP. I switch out to powerlifting on the crunch and risk a crit from body slam to use a boosted revenge, finally putting an end to this awful battle. Alright. I switch out to Adoption as Spark brings us low. Based on the damage Hale did, we can stay in for one fake out. Hale leaves Adoption on 2 HP. 
Toothache is the only one I have left with any HP, so I switch it on the Spark, and that did more than I was expecting. I risked the switch into Rock Climbing, and Pink Kirchen uses Spark, but kinda did kill. Rock's low, so at least this base Bubble Beam rather than Curse did comes out, and it is indeed enough to get the kill, putting it into this awful battle. What's Hop been on recently? Look at what he did to my team. Have I ever struggled this much against Hop? Maybe during my Ditto only challenge, but that's probably not a fair comparison. Let's just move on. I decided it's best to skip encounters for now on Route 9 until we really need one, but I do decide to head back into the wild area. I should also note that I messed up the level cap on the graphic for the next two gyms, but I never used Pokemon that exceed the real level cap. The first one I decided to get is one that I've had my eye on, but exceeded the catch cap at the time, but would be really useful for the next gym, especially after losing our childhood. That being this Howlucha in the Hammerlock Hills. It's kind of below the current level cap, but that's not stopped any of my encounters from excelling. I call them college. But the one I absolutely wanted to get is finally within my reach and is back in the bridge field near the daycare. We specifically wanted to be raiding as this is the condition needed to spawn this magnificent creature right here. Seismitoid has a lot of utility, an amazing typing, access to some pretty good moves, and is also pretty bulky. Hangover will also be our highest leveled Pokemon and sits directly on the level cap. And if he couldn't possibly get better, he came with Swift Swim, which doubles speed in the rain. And guess which ability one of our Pokemon has? So we can head straight into Spike Myth. Running into an unrival battle. Lipard hits a Sucker Punch and falls to a single player off from Toothache. Into Rock Climbing on the failed Sucker Punch and we get hit by the next one as we dig into the ground. Rock's Dig gets the one shot. Back into Toothache on the Brick Break and I set up a worship Scrafty lowers our speed. Scrafty didn't realize it's already faster than us and a four times effective Stab Play Rough doesn't get the kill. Interesting. Wish brings us back to full. Money heals and Play Rough brings us back. Scrofty tries for a last his swagger, but Toothache pushes past the confusion to finish her off with Energy Ball. I switch out to Rock on the Spark and back into the Tooth on the Bites, getting rid of the confusion. Mopeka uses Torment and we hit a play rough, bring it into red. I tried that four times. Spark hits, and then crits, and then paralyzes. But this is Toothache. She hits Energy Ball, ending the battle. We needed that. On to Piers. Piers 2 leads us Crafty, and I forgot I still had Toothache in the lead, who gets her attack load by Intimidate. I decide to take the fake out flinch, and I'll speed the next turn to hit a 4 times effective play rough that does just over half. But lowers Crafty's attack. Scrafty uses his pocket sand to lower accuracy. And yet Toothache hits her play rough anyway, ending Scrafty. Next up's Melomar, so I stand to take the Psycho Cut, activating the Citrus Berry and let out a play rough which once again hits, but doesn't really do much. I then remember that Malamar has Contrary and almost gave it a free attack boost. I switch out to Adoption on the Psycho Cut. After flinching Malamar with Fake Owls, I start setting up Home Claws as Malamar uses a Pitiful Night Slash, until it uses Foul Play using my attack boost against me. Citrus Berry restores some HP, but I'm going down to another regardless. I don't want my other Pokemon taking damage yet, so I let out a plus two Stab Sucker Punch, and we don't get the kill. Goodbye Adoption. I send out College and Brick Break finishes Malamar off, and Pierce sends out Obstagoon. He knows this is four times weak against fighting, right? Did he really think I didn't know his tricks? I set up a Home Claws as Obstagoon fails a counter. I set up a second Home Claws as Shadow Claw does just under half. Pierce does read me the next turn using Obstruct to protect itself, also lowering my defense by two stages. No matter as College outspeeds, hitting a plus two, four times effective Stab Brick Break, only doing 75%. Shadow Claw finishes College off. Huh? What happened? Has Obstagoon always been this bulky? Like, I'm aware of the 10 level difference, but that's not really been an issue before. Especially after the boosts. I send out a Hangover and try for a Drain Punch, but once again get obstructed. Obstagoon now speeds, hitting Throat Chop, doing over half, activating Citrus Berry, and Drain Punch finally finishes this monster off. I'm at minus to defense, so I switch out to Rock Climbing on Skuntang's failed Sucker Punch. Skuntang hits his next Sucker Punch, and oh my god, why appears this Pokemon running through me? Thankfully it outspeeds, missing Snarl. Dig does just about 75%. For reference, that's the same amount as College's plus two, four times effective Brick Break against Obstagoon. And this time I was with an even greater level difference of 12. I'm still salty. I bring Hangover back and end this with the Bulldoze. This section of the game has been unreasonably hard, and isn't even going to be the worst of it. First things first, I need encounters. Now you may have noticed, I've been pretty conservative when it comes to encounters so far. This is because we're absolutely going to need new encounters for the next part of the game, and encounters are actually of a decent level too. We still have the catch cap that this game added, and we don't really want to waste the few encounters we have left in the wild area. 
The only route left, aside from Route 9 where I skipped my encounter, is Route 10. And then the wild area is all we have left. You may have thought I've been too liberal with losing encounters up till now, but like I said, it's only gonna get worse if you start fighting hard leveled Pokemon. But at the very least, I have a solid plan for the next gym as I always get screwed over by Raihan during my challenge runs. And there's only one more encounter I have in mind for my next battle, which I honestly should have gotten earlier. And that's back in the giant seat, which I skipped this time unlike my last run. If we come to this section where we can get leftovers during specific weather, in my case it was a sandstorm, we can run into Vikavolt. And Vikavolt is amazing. I ignored it initially because I thought it was going to be a higher level than the level cap, but anxiety turned out to be the same level as Hangover. Vikavolt 2 is a stony evo as of this game and gets the same benefits as the rest, getting an amazing move pool just through the mover learner. This includes two stab 90 base power moves, Thunderbolt and Bug Buzz, but we also get some good utility stuff like sticky webs to lower opponent speed on the switch in. And my god, look at that special attack. No, really, look at it. And that's 5 points lower than Dialga and Palkia. Remember, this is a regional bug in the same vein as Beedraw or Vivalon. Alola was wild. And that's all I'm getting for now. We can save the rest for later. We have exactly everyone we need for Raihan. Let's destroy the final gym. Raihan leads with Flygon and Gigalith. And I sent out Parasailing and Toothache. Gigalith sets up Sandstorm using his ability, but I gave Parasailing an Iron Ball which cuts its speed in half. Meaning, we can override that with Drizzle. And I switched right into Hangover, anticipating the Thunder Punch from Flygon. Huh? Hangover gets his attack lowered by Breaking Swipe. Toothache hits the play rough, doing under half, and Gigalith sets up Stealth Rocks. Seriously though, that was like the worst move Flygon could have used in this situation. The AI truly vexes me. Regardless, we move forward, Hangover outspeeds with Swift Swim, using Weather Ball to one-shot Gigalith. And Flygon's Steel Wing does just about half, activating Citrus Berry. Play rough brings Flygon into red. This brings us Sandaconda while Flygon's still on the field. I then switch Toothache into Rock Climbing as Hangover protects. Rock tanks the Steel Wing from Flygon and Hangover protects himself from Glare. Now watch this masterful play. Swift Swim allows Hangover to outspeed as it rains up and one shots Sandaconda with Weather Ball. And Sandaconda's ability sets up the Sandstorm after being hit. And now Rock Climbing can outspeed with his ability Sand Rush which double speed in the Sandstorm, finishing Flygon off with Metal Claw. And what this does is bring out the Ace Duraludon all by his lonesome. This would've been perfect had Flygon just used Thunder Punch. Now Duraludon only has one super effective move against our Pokemon on the field, and that's on Rock where I switch out for Halloween. Duraludon Gigantamaxes and his Max Knuckle is nullified. Hangover digs into the ground unharmed. I was genuinely worried in the moment. We've seen what the AI is like. Duraludon outspeeds, so there's no way he's heading Hangover, and Halloween is most certainly able to tank at least one hit. Okay, it does. I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Hangover's at minus one attack, but Dick still does quite a bit. And I use this as an opportunity to hit Duraludon with Will O Wisp, halving its attack. For some reason, the special attacking Ace is a full physical moveset. Don't ask me why. I spend the final turn of Gigantamax protecting Hangover and switch Halloween out for Rock Climbing, who would resist the G Max depletion. Duraludon does indeed target the protected Hangover, and his Gigantamax finally ends. The sand still ups so Rock can outspeed into the ground, causing Duraludon's body press to miss, and Hangover gets off a drain punch doing a decent amount. And this next part was completely unplanned. Sand ends the very turn that rocks underground, causing Duraludon to outspeed, missing yet another turn. God, this battle was top tier. Though Hangover does get his attack lowered, he still packs a punch, and Rock Climbing does the honors with the final dig. And we have gotten every badge in Galar, never once earning XP. Well, a meaningful amount. However, if you've watched my other videos in Shield, you'd know that we aren't anywhere near the end. Despite having every badge, we still have 10 more important battles coming up, all featuring Dynamax with Pokemon at very high levels, while having a total of 9 encounters still available to us. How long's this video? Alright, let's pick up the pace. We've got a boss rush coming up, so let's focus all our attention on that. There's only one encounter on Route 10 that would be helpful to us, and it's guaranteed. This absolute unit is level 55 and will basically be our highest leveled Pokemon for the next few battles. While Snowball does exceed my current level cap, but it'll be valid soon enough. And he also has an adamant nature, which is like the best one for him. Am I actually allowed to be hopeful for a change? We also head back to the Stony Wilderness to welcome back Holiday. I honestly thought it'd be a higher level, but it still gets a busted moveset. And the final encounter I won is actually back in Turfield. Many people don't actually know about this one, but there is actually a single Crawdon guarding the river of Turfield. This is the only encounter that exists here, and for some reason never respawns unlike other static Pokemon. With how special he is, Rave is a must-add to the team. Unfortunately, he also exceeds the current level cap for now. And that's literally it. On to our first Champion Cup preliminary battle. Marnie leaves with Lipard and immediately goes for a nasty plot, doubling a special attack as Toothache's Draining Kiss does just under half. Lipard's hubris gets the better of her as she sets up another nasty plot, getting annihilated by Play Rough. 
With Toxicroak out, I switch into Rock Climbing expecting the poison move, but before we can dig into the ground, Toxicroak confuses us with Swagger, but Rock Climbing is indeed enough to pull through, one-shotting with a plus two dig. Back in the toothache for Scrafty as she takes a brick break, which we can just recover back with the draining kiss, doing just under half as her speed's lowered. Crunch does nothing and Play Rough obliterates Scrafty. I figure there's no reason to switch out. Morpeko Spark activates Citrus Berry and the draining kiss looks to do exactly half. Another Spark and another draining kiss, but we don't get the kill. But no matter, we can just use a play rough. Money heals Morpeko back up to full. And we miss play rough. This wasn't the way it was supposed to go. Alright, we're still at full health. Let's just stay in. And Spark paralyzes. But Toothache does get off her wish. Morpeko torments us, and Toothache's able to push past paralysis. Missing another play rough. That's like a 1% chance to miss two back to back. Whatever, let's just get off another wish. We can at least survive one more non crit. Which we do. And then Toothache can't move. It's fine, Toothache's just tired after carrying the team for so long. Alright, so onto rock climbing on the spark. Bites us how much? We don't flinch and dig into the ground. Dick comes out to one shot. It was just that easy, huh? And finally we're on the ace Grim Snarl. Now I really wanted Toothache specifically to be the one out, as now Grim Snarl is going for a dark move. And we have no Pokemon that would survive that. I figure my only place to protect. G-Max News comes out. And even with the protect up, it manages to end rock climbing's long tenure. Thank you for your long service, Rock. That was especially devastating considering an upcoming battle. I bring out Halloween, protecting the first turn. G-Max News still does a lot of damage, and I switch out to Toothache to absorb the final G-Max News, which absolutely would have killed if Chris, and the attack titan returns to normal. I don't know what move's coming next, so I switch into Hangover, who takes half from Darkest Lariat. This thing is insane. At least we trigger our berry, guaranteeing us another turn. But I switch out to Anxiety anyway as Grimstar sets up a bulk up. And the absolute fool wastes a turn using Torment. Thunderbolt does over half. And after Anxiety survives on just a sliver of health, a final bug buzz finishes this roller coaster of a battle. That first half had me completely fooled. I was absolutely not expecting it to be this close. Like had Grimmsnarl attacked instead of using Torment, we would have had to easily sack another Pokemon. Our loss was devastating, but no time to grieve. We have our battle against Hop. Hop leaves a double and we once again lead with powerlifting. The stun double gains the upper hand using Cotton Guard, giving himself a defense boost of plus 3, and our unboosted revenge does nothing. Let's try this one more time. Double hits a Zen Headbutt, leaving powerlifting on just 13 HP, but we get to use a boosted revenge, this time bringing double below half. I switch out to Holiday on Zen Headbutt, and after a body slam activates my berry, Psyching misses the kill by literally 1 HP. It's okay, I wanted Hop to use this potion anyway. I stand for two more Psychics, but it's clear that I need to switch. Into Halloween, I have no moves to hit double. Instead, burn stalling it while it uses Zen Headbutts, never really doing much. Also, Hop has dialogue if you use an ineffective move. I thought that was a nice touch. Double finally goes down. Snorlax is already out, but his moveset is actually nerfed for this battle. It doesn't even get a stab move. I figure the best course of action is to burn him as soon as possible. Next in the hangover on the heavy slam, and now I can just keep using Drain Punch, recovering all the damage Snorlax does to me with his halved attack. Until one finally brings him down. Or the burn does it for me. Corviknight's next, but this time we have the perfect counter. However, Drill Pack still does a lot of anxiety. We'll survive the crit, so I stand for a Thunderbolt, which doesn't get the kill. These close calls have been happening far too often recently. Also, I was a bit confused as to why my berry didn't activate. It was because Corviknight has the ability on Nerve. I switch out to Toothache on the Drill Pack, and then hang over on the Steel Wing. Why is Corviknight so fast? A Drain Punch finishes it off, and we can finally eat our berry. Pink Urchin's next, but Hangover walls it completely. It goes down to a couple of digs, just holding on a bit longer using curses. Time for Hop's Ace, Rillaboom, and I'll be honest, my team's in rough shape. There's only one way we're stalling out this Dynamax. Goodbye powerlifting. Toothache can eat her berry and protect, tanking max overgrowth pretty well. And look, here's the thing. I need another sack, and none of my Pokemon are surviving a max overgrowth. And Toothache's the lowest leveled. She has been a great addition to my team, carrying us all the way back from the 4th gym, but I think her time's up. I give her a fighting chance using Protect, and she actually pulls it off. What a legend. And then Rillaboom uses Max Quake, raising his special defense, which is terrible for us. I could have switched into Anxiety and avoided this entirely since it has Levitate, but now I need to sack, even with Rillaboom turning back to normal. I'm sorry Toothache, you really did hold on until the very end. Are you kidding me? I could have switched out Anxiety this turn as well. Why is Rillaboom even using a ground move? They're weakened in a grassy terrain. And they're the ones that set it up. The AI, man. I bring Anxiety out and he eats his berry. And then Rillaboom locks itself into uproar. Hop is actually the worst. His special defense boost allows him to survive a bug buzz, but after the next uproar, another one finishes Rillaboom off. And we're done with this heartbreaking segment. 
two back-to-back -back losses and both battles ended up being super close. And these were just the first two battles, there's still eight more. Let's look on the bright side. We've lost two veterans, but our level cap has increased significantly, opening us up to a whole new variety of encounters. Starting with the one that we caught not too long ago, Snowboard. A chapter ends, a chapter begins. But first, Hop's not himself and he's hungry. Nah, actually he's as useless as he always is. Hop, go eat by yourself. How is it so confusing that the champion has a meeting with the chairman of the Pokemon League? What even is this reaction? There's a vending machine right there. What series of events during the sequence led us to getting the key? Why is this our problem? Hop's actually useless. You brought me here, at least use a Pokemon that's good against Steel. Hop's f useless. Okay, it's not all doom and gloom. Oleana's still as fine as ever. First up's Frostless, who we want to get rid of as soon as possible. She leaves with a burn, so Rafe's crunch does just over half. Frostless begins her double team spam, but Rafe still manages to hit the second crunch, putting an end to Frostless. With Zari now, so I switch into Snowboard as she uses as a tract. I should really keep Snowboard away from the internet. Snowboard is immobilized once. Snowboard is immobilized twice. Zarina uses acrobatics, and we finally hit an avalanche, one shot in Zarina. Next is Salazzle, so I switch into Hangover on the Incinerate, which burns my berry. We get hit with a Dragon Pulse, but Salazzle falls to a single stomping tantrum. Milotic's also a Pokemon that could cause some issues if she's on the field for too long. I switch right into Anxiety as she sets up an Aqua Ring. Milotic opts to use a Safeguard for some reason, and Thunderbolt does over half. Milotic attacks with a Surf that does well over half. Two of those would have certainly killed. A second Thunderbolt electrocutes Milotic. I absolutely love that Oleon has a Garbodor and that she's her ace. More people really need to appreciate Garbodor. Especially Game Freak. Come on, give it a better moves and stats. And why not Mega while you're at it? I still have the first turn using Protect and switch into Hangover on the second Max Rockfall. I know Max Quake's coming, so I switch into Holiday, who's immune, and the Dynamax is already over. Poor Garbodor misses Gunk Shot and Psychic does over half. And then Garbodor sets up Toxic Spikes. On the last turn. One last Psychic, and we're done with the second worst villain plot. Well, first we need to watch Rose's MLM PowerPoint. So, this is where I made a bit of a mistake. After being done with the plot, I figured let's just head straight to the Champion Cup. I mean, we have all the encounters we need, right? Well, I may have forgotten about a teeny little battle that happens before we can actually start the championship. We don't actually have any encounters to deal with fairy types. So, we could just go back to the wild area to catch some, right? A small problem with that. I'm held hostage. So now we have to fight this prick using only the encounters I have in my box. And like I said earlier, I've been pretty reserved when it came to actually catching Pokemon. I cannot describe how much planning I did for this battle just in order to not get the worst case scenario. But unfortunately, I don't think I can do this without sacking at least some Pokemon. Or at the very least, risking some pretty valuable encounters. Let's get this over with. Beat leaves with more while and I bring back Sports Day. Sports Day absorbs the Intimidate, but its sole purpose was to use a Will-O-Wisp. I even gave him a Choice Scarf because I was unsure if he would outspeed with that level gap. And he even survives a Crunch. Now the next few steps are important. I switch out to Anxiety, taking the Crunch, and then staying on the Player Rough to set up a Sticky Web. Next into Halloween to absorb the Player Rough, and we can finally swap into Rave to take the not very effective Crunch. And his defense gets lowered. We were doing so good. Alright, I don't really want the defense drop, so into Snowboard and then back into Rave on the not very effective Iron Head. Honestly, should have done this to begin with. And with a week in Mawile, we're safe to start setting up Swords Dance. Also good to know that we outspeed. Play Rough still does a lot, but Citrus Berry heals us up, and Rave even has Shell Armor, which means he can never get crit. I figure why not stay in front of the Swords Dance, and Play Rough brings Rave low, and now we can just use a plus 4 dive to finish Mawile off. God of War's next, and it would've outsped if not for our Sticky Web. A plus 4 dive gets us the one shot. Rapidash comes out, and it does get its speed lowered, but I'll be honest. I got cold feet. Rapidash's only good stat is speed, and Crawdon really isn't that fast to begin with. I decide to concede my boosts and switch to Halloween. On the Dazzling Gleam. Why does it have a special move? It's a physical attacker. I was sure it had play rough. This kind of sucks because my plan was to burn it to half its attack, but now it has a strong attack to hit us regardless. Also that Psycho Cut would have absolutely killed if crit. I was saving seafood for a special occasion, but I decided it's best to get the safe switch now. But into who? There's still the Dynamax in the back that I need to worry about, and now I know for a fact that I need to sack one of my good mons to stall it out. Rapidash isn't exactly strong, but it can still do a decent amount to weaken me. I decide this job's meant for anxiety. Dazzling Gleam does a lot more than I was expecting, but with the Berry Heal, I think we're just outside of crit range. Thunderbolt does over half. We should be fine. 
and then Beed uses a full restore, which not only heals Rapidash's HP, but also his burn. Meaning now it's going for a Psycho Cut, which we absolutely won't survive a crit from, but there really is nothing else we can do. I stay in, and Anxiety survives. A final Thunderbolt ends Rapidash. We're on Bead's final Pokemon, and I'm honestly not even sure where I go from here. Anxiety is in no position to protect, and we really need him for Nessa. And with how low his HP is, we can't even base a move. I figure there's no point in being indecisive. What we need to do is regain control of the board, and we do have one Pokemon still at full HP that will also bait the move that we want. But for the safe switch, we have to say a sad goodbye to Rave, who left this world too early. And this mother used Max Flare anyway. We could have avoided a death. Well, there was no way to know for sure, so that was probably still the best move in this situation. And this gives me a free switch into Snowboard. With the sun up and a nice type out, there is only one move that Hadarine would go for. Into Sports Day, and he absorbs the Max Flare with his Flash Fire ability. I give him a chance to protect, but that was a futile attempt. Thank you, Sports Day. I can bring Snowboard back out, and Hatterene returns back to normal. I was expecting an attack, so I used Avalanche, which does just under half. But we can put this battle along behind us with the final Ice Punch. That battle was something. Every single one of my rival battles have been alright, though I think this one was just simply due to my lack of foresight. If I just remembered that Bead existed, I would have absolutely used up an encounter spot for a steel type, but we had to make do with the Pokemon that we had, and you know, I think we did good. I am still upset about Rave though. Something our battle with Bead made me realise is how slow all of our encounters are. Now getting new encounters would be the next logical step, right? Well, I will get one that I skipped earlier on Route 9, but the reason I went to the stadium in the first place was because I was prepared. You know, for the other three. On Route 9, I shared to the center as the Pokemon here are of a higher level, and are just better in general. We land a Toxapex. You know, I'm not complaining, but this doesn't really help with the speed situation I made light of earlier. Also, guess who graduation would have been really useful against? Let's jump into our battle with Nessa. Nessa leaves with Glycopod and I send out Anxiety. First impression does over half, triggering the berry, and a single Thunderbolt takes Glycopod down. I'm not sure if the crit mattered. Seeking sets up an Aqua Ring and then gets electrocuted by Thunderbolt. I'm pretty certain that crit didn't matter. Barrascuda comes out, and Liquidation does way more than I was expecting, even lowering my defense, but Anxiety has the taste for blood. Thunderbolt one-shots Barrascuda. Pelipper's next, and I would have loved to stay in, but we need to leave. I bring out Snowboard on the water pulse doing about a third, and stay in for another which triggers the berry. Snowboard uses a boosted avalanche, just missing the kill, and Pelipper sets up a tailwind on his final turn, fades into a second avalanche. Finally, the Giganta maxing Dreadnought. I saw the first turn using Protect, taking the max rock fall. Switch out to Hangover for the next. And one more Protect on G-Max Stone Surge, which activates my berry. The Tailwind conveniently peters out as Dreadnought returns to normal. Liquidation does a lot, and Stomping Tantrum does over half. I switch out to Graduation on Liquidation, and an Internship on Rock Tomb. He tanks Liquidation, and one last Drain Punch wins us the first battle of the Champion Cup. A nice straightforward battle for a change. Just what we needed. But this was only the first of three. Onto our favorite Beatrice. Her first Pokemon is Halucha, who's incredibly easy to cheese. I lead with Snowboard and just switch out to Halloween on the high jump kick. Back into Snowboard on the bounce. Protect myself from the bounce. And back to Halloween for the high jump kick. Goodbye, Halucha. Next is Surfage, who I tank a Brutal Swing from and burn with Will-O-Wisp. Out into Internship on the second Brutal Swing. Now we can just heal back the meager damage Surfage can do to us with Draining Punch. Winning the one-on-one -on -one while being close to full health. Next up is Phalanx, who legitimately could be scary. I switch into Halloween on the close combat, and as it bulks up, burn it with Will-O-Wisp. I switch back into Internship, and out comes the No Retreat, giving Phalanx an Omni boost. Thankfully the burn means it will just do a regular amount of damage. Phalanx goes for a close combat, actually not doing much, also lowering his defense, and we can just Drain Punch away. With the berry and the HP we recover back from Drain Punch, we can stick it out until burn finishes Phalanx off. Next is Grappalox, and this unfortunate creature has no moves to ghosts. I try and make this as painless as possible. And finally the Ace Machamp. Now Machamp this time does not have a single super effective move against Ghost, instead having a fire move. So I switch into Hangover on the Max Flare and then back into Halloween on the signature G Max move. Then back into Hangover on the second Max Flare, triggering his berry. Dynamax over. Now I kinda came to a realization just about now. I don't have any Pokemon that actually directly counter Machamp as Halloween has taken too much damage. This was kinda risky, like ever so slightly, but I decided to poison her using Graduation's Baneful Bunker and just do a classic poison stall. I try for a recover, but Guts Boost's strength does way too much. I fall back to switching between Halloween and my two water Pokemon. This takes ages, but we never really come across any danger. Machamp finally succumbs to poison. And that's the second battle done. In complete contrast to a gym battle, this was the easiest battle we've had so far. 
Everything just works out exactly to plan, and her Pokemon are so easy to counter. Alistair in comparison is a far more threatening presence, but it's not over yet. One last battle. On to Raihan. Raihan leads with Torkoal and once again send out the Iron Ball clad in Parasailing. Torkoal sets up the sun, but we are under speed to set up rain. Now I switch straight into Hangover as Torkoal hits us with a yawn. Sleep will be annoying to deal with, but I stand to use a Weather Ball one shot in Torkoal. Next is Flygon, so I switch into Snowboard as it sets up Sandstorm. I'm not sure how this benefits it, but okay. Earthquake does a lot, but just misses activating the Citrus Berry and a 4 times effective Ice Punch one shot. Sandstorm actually helps us out as it does just enough to trigger Snowballed Citrus Berry. Next is Hersonator, and I figured now's the best time to shake off Hangover's Nap. This thing loves using Shell Trap, which never activates if we don't attack. We stay asleep the next turn as it sets up Sun again, and the next turn we wake up to use Stomping Tantrum, just missing the kill. Also, Shell Trap does a lot despite not being very effective, but with Hersonator, I just opt to use a couple of 4 times weak Fire type Weather Balls knowing it will only ever go for Shell Trap. It has Dragon Pulse, just use it. Gudra comes out and I switch back into Snowboard as it sets up rain. Raihan's gym battle was actually pretty cool with the Sandstorm theme, but I have no clue what he was thinking with this team. I stay to tank the Surf, which absolutely would have killed if Chris, and a boosted Avalanche gets the one shot. And we're on the final Pokemon of the Champion Cup semi-finals, and the final turn for Parasailing. Good job, buddy. Into Halloween, and with him being at full health, I figure I can tank and attack. Raihan sticks to Max Rockfall for some reason, and yeah, we had nothing to worry about. We get off a Will-O-Wisp, and we can just protect on the Max Steel Spike, which actually kind of sucks as now Duraludon has a defense boost. Duraludon returns to normal and we send out the internship. Literally any damage it does to us can be healed back by Drain Punch, and the final Drain Punch wins us the final battle of the semi-finals. Any single one of the rival battles were harder than all three of those last three battles combined. Like, they definitely needed some planning, but I never once felt threatened like I did with Bead. I can't believe I'm actually admitting that I struggled against the rivals. But with that, we're finally approaching the end. Thanks for explaining the plot to me, Rose. I genuinely wouldn't have known there was one otherwise. Why does he deliver this line in the most Disney villain-esque way? Like, isn't the point that he thinks he's doing this for the benefit of Galar? He says this like he knows he's evil. Well, with access to the slumbering wield, we get access to a new encounter. Ignore that, ignore that, you didn't see that. Alright, real encounter time. I got one already. That was a 5% encounter. It's also hilarious to me that Weezing is the most common encounter in the final dungeon. Like, we're about to visit the graves of the fabled Galarian legends, and on the way to do so, our main obstacle is a 19th century factory line manager. Speaking of which, 9 to 5 is also our new encounter. I do like the subtle storytelling that the reason the forest is so foggy is because of these guys. Knowing Game Freak, I'm 99% sure that wasn't intentional. We literally just figured that one out up. Wait, no, I'm the one that suggested this place. Grave robbing is perfectly alright if it's done with a friend. Anyway, time for Rose. Rose leads with Escavalier, and I send out an internship. Escavalier melts to a single fire punch. Ferrothorn melts to a single fire punch. After a wild charge, Kling Kling actually manages to survive the first drain punch. Unfortunately, Gear Grind does way more and Drain Punch doesn't really heal much as Clang Clang goes down. That being said, Rose is kind enough to send out Berserker, who we outspeed and one shot to recover all of our HP back. Finally, it's Copperaja. Now, this thing does have a psychic move, but I was feeling a little wacky and staying on the max Mindstorm for whatever dumb, stupid reason. But Internship survives. A boosted revenge. Doesn't get the kill. Imagine how cool that would have been. Into Holiday on the next Max Mindstorm and Protect on the Max Steel Surge. This move actually does something pretty cool that I only recently found out. It sets up a steel version of Stealth Rocks. Why didn't they add this effect as a separate move as well? Fairies need to be knocked down a peg. Though I suppose Ice Steps already have it hard enough. Anyway, Copperaja goes down to hang over Stomping Tantrum. And that's Rose. These battles have been far too easy, though I probably shouldn't speak too soon. Poor Oleana never had a chance. Leon apparently left his Master Ball at home and is stuck using a Pokeball to capture a rejected Ultra Beast. Couldn't you have at least forked out an extra 400 for a Great Ball? To everyone's surprise, it didn't work out and now we have to pick up the slack. I sent out 9 to 5 as it pretty much walls Eternatus. And what is this move says? What was I thinking? Alright, let's swap out to Hangover. Okay, no, back to 9 to 5. I switched into Snowball on the Cross Poison and thank god it uses another. A boosted Avalanche prevents a disaster from happening. I should stop underestimating random battles. Hop sees destruction all around him, his friends and family are in peril before his eyes, and this psychopath smiles. No flashy tactics here, we're just gonna let the box legendaries handle this one while we protect ourselves. It's their game after all. Hop finally finds his role as a teammate. 
mostly being base. But after a couple of switches and a couple of protects, the box legendaries finally do their jobs, and we can finally start bringing this challenge to an end. So we're in the home stretch now, and while I would have loved to use the Pokemon that brought me here, the levels jump up pretty significantly, and I think a 20 level difference might be us pushing our luck. But we still have more encounters left in the wild area, and there was a reason why I left them alone until now. Most people know that once you beat the game, all Pokemon in the wild area get the levels bumped to level 60. What many people don't know is that you don't actually have to wait until the post game, as this actually occurs the moment you're done with the Eternatus plotline. And for the champion with Pokemon in the 60s, this level boost is much needed. And I've already got a few encounters in mind, so let's head back to the first zone of the wild area and clean up our remaining encounters here. I should note that I had an encounter in the Dappled Grove, which I found was far below my levels at the time. I shouldn't have killed Beware, but I was kinda caught off guard. So yeah. The first one's back in Nord Lake Marlock. I ignore the section as the encounter levels here were pretty low, but what we can do now is surf on the water. Now I don't know if these particular encounters are static, but one that is, is this Lapras right here. And catching Marriage will give us our first level 60 Pokemon, making the subsequent ones easier to catch. And the final area left in the first zone is Axew's Eye, where there is a single static majestic Haxorus just hanging out. It's probably my favourite dragon type line, so it has to be part of my team. I don't even hate the 3D model to be honest. Thanks to Marriage, Mortgage gets in the first quick ball I throw. With us wrapped up with the first section, our next one is actually in the Dusty Bowl. Now you may have thought that we already got rock climbing from here, but Exedril's spawn and encounter location was actually the Giant's Mirror, which allows us to get a special static spawn here. Under specific weather, you can find the game's exclusive pseudo-legendary just walking around in the wild. I typically don't use them, but recently I've been reconsidering my stance on legendaries and pseudo-legendaries, and with Komo being one of the weaker ones, I figured I'd give her a chance. Also, how is she faster than Haxorus? Komo breaks out of the first quick ball and sets up a dragon dance. Kinda scary, but it is night time, so we can just throw a dusk ball. Which it breaks out of to set up another dragon dance. This could end badly. We throw another one. And it actually gets in. I was really worried in the moment. I would have gladly ran away if I set up another. Welcome childbirth. What was I thinking with my names? I always thought Komo got shafted when it came to its stats compared to the other pseudo-legendaries. It doesn't really excel in anything. Also, just as a note, this isn't a hard rule, but I won't be using Dragon Dance Spam as I would make the entire game too easy. The next one is just up on the Giant's Cap, that being Dublade. We can evolve retirement into an Aegis Slash using a Dust Stone, and it gets some pretty good moves. And our final encounter is on the Lake of Outrage, where we ironically catch the fairy type, Guard of War. Death will be our final piece of the puzzle for defeating Leon. I also bring Internship along as I need a 6th Pokemon, and he was the highest leveled one who I thought would be useful. All that's left is Evolving Retirement, revamping our Pokemon's moves, and we're ready to finally bring one of my longest challenges to a close. Our final team for Leon is Internship, the Conkelda, Marriage, the Lapras, Mortgage, the Haxorus, Childbirth, the Komodo, Retirement, the Aegis Lash, and finally Death, the God of War. Leon leaves with Aegis Lash, and I send out Retirement. I use the first turn to set up a Swords Dance, expecting King Shield, and it seems like we outspeed. Aegis Lash immediately goes for the offensive, using Shadow Ball, leaving Retirement on just 7 HP. That did far more than I was expecting with us still in Shield form. At the very least, now I'm in kill range, meaning we can avoid King Shield to use a plus 2 super effective Shadow Sneak to get the one shot on Leon's first Pokemon. Next is Leon's terrifying Haxorus. I switch into Marriage so she can take the Earthquake, but it crits, bringing her well below half. Citrus Berry activates, but I'm not sure if she can survive the Outrage. I stay into use Ice Beam, and she does not. An Outrage ends my Marriage. At least now Haxorus is locked into Outrage, allowing me to bring out Death. Haxorus outspeeds, but Death is unaffected by the Outrage, getting off a free Expert Belt boosted Moonblast. Something something dead to us part. Dragapult's out, and while Death does have super effective moves, I'm not confident she can survive the Shadow Ball. But Childbirth with her ability Bulletproof nullifies it completely. Dragapult outspeeds to use a super effective Dragon Breath. Why does it have that? And Childbirth survives to use a super effective Clanging Scales, our pseudo-legendary one-shotting Leon pseudo-legendary. I absolutely love that a champion has Mr. Rhyme on his team. Now Childbirth is weak against both of Mr. Rhyme's stabs, so I have no idea which move's coming out. And Mr. Rhyme can hit pretty hard, so sorry Childbirth. I send to use a rock slide hoping for the flinch, but Mr. Rhyme pushes past that using a psychic. And I think I know better than to actually say what I wrote here, so goodbye Childbirth. I bring Aegis Slash out of retirement and end Mr. Rhyme's career with a shadow sneak. Inteleon 2 hits pretty hard, and might use a random move, so I don't really want to switch out. We stand to use a Shadow Sneak, and Inteleon puts Retirement down. Back into Death, who tanks a Snipe Shot and uses a Moon Blast, putting Inteleon right into heal range. Leon heals, and another one puts Inteleon below half, also lowering a special attack. Now we can survive a normal Snipe Shot, but we're going down to a crit. 
and Snipeshot has an increased crit chance. But Death survives, finishing Inteleon off with a Moonblast, and finally we're on Leon's Ace Charizard. Now there isn't really much for us to do here unfortunately, and Death uses a last resort protect. Max Airstream comes out, and Death actually survives. She can stall one more turn as Max Airstream brings her down. The next is an internship to take the final turn. Max Airstream comes out, and internship was holding a focus sash to survive on just one HP. He can use a four times effective rock slide doing what seems to be exactly half and Charizard returns to normal. Unfortunately, we need a clean switch, so Charizard outspeeds to use an air slash. Goodbye internship. And I send out my final Pokemon, Mortgage. Now here's the small thing. Charizard is most definitely using air slash, which A, has a 30% chance to flinch, and B, could crit to just one-shot me entirely. And even if these things don't happen, we have a 10% chance to miss Rock Slide. Air slash comes out, it doesn't crit. It doesn't flinch. And Mortgage pulls off the rock slide, foreclosing on Charizard's life. And the Nuzlocke. I was not expecting that battle to be so close. I even got Pokemon that were actually close to Leon's levels. But man, my heart was actually racing during the end, especially after realizing my mistake on Leon's final Pokemon. But battles like these always end up being my favorite. This was probably one of the more difficult challenges I've done, and I can see this being a lot harder in other games. The main reason I chose this game in the first place was because we were able to catch multiple high level Pokemon before the champion. This luxury doesn't really exist in any other mainline game up to this point. I think in other games you'll have to choose your encounters for this challenge to be feasible at all, so that might be one change I made to my rule set. I mean once I started catching static encounters, that's pretty much what I was doing anyway. I definitely see it being far more difficult in other games, so I'm looking forward to trying those out. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate all the support I've been getting lately, even with the long delays between videos. Making these longer ones really takes a lot out of me, but seeing all the positive reception really helps me push through and feel more motivated to finish up the projects I've started. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing if you enjoy my content. The validation makes making videos so much easier. I'm trying to think of ways I can make some shorter videos in between my longer ones to keep that content flowing without getting too burnt out playing Nuzlocke's. I've got a couple of ideas, but one I wanted some feedback on was whether any of you'd be interested in seeing a series. Like I've been wanting to do something like a Pixel 1 Hardcore Nuzlocke for a while now, something that isn't really feasible as a one-time video. So I was thinking I could make something like an ongoing series, you know, alongside my regular edited videos of course. Please let me know in the comments what you think, or if you have any ideas. This is kind of how I want to do my first Violet run when that comes out, so I don't have to rush the game just to make content on it. So I think this could be a really good test run. So please let me know what you think, and look forward to more videos in the future.